I will tell you the main rules that are uh, that you have to follow when uh, developing an event sourced application. Um, <clears throat> I work as a PHP programmer responsible mainly for uh, backend development. At least since my team colleagues said, you'd better don't touch this front anymore. <laughs> um, currently, I'm working in Shipstead Tech Polska, uh, which is sponsoring this event, and you can find our stand uh, behind the wall. Um, <clears throat> that is actually a beginning of, uh, of the event sourcing in my life. <laughs> It's a photo from Symphony Life London in 2015, a year ago. We went there, of course, with uh, Shipstead. Uh, and we heard about event sourcing there. And uh, it, it looked powerful. So a month later, when we were about to start a new project, um, we decided to make it event sourced. Event sourcing became a very popular topic then, and uh, so I've prepared a short presentation for our local meetup in, in Gdańsk, and now it's time to, to share this knowledge with you here. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's tell about how we build applications in traditional way. Uh, applications based on cre create, read, update, delete operations, and uh, based on current state. <coughs> and this is a current state concept means uh, it's saving only a state of all objects and uh, mm, there is no way to investigate uh, what actions took place and uh, what were the previous uh, states of, of, uh, of the objects in applications. Mm. And uh, when you want to investigate what was happening, it's uh, often the only possibility is to compare uh, the states of the objects. And I was doing, I was doing that often in my life, and it uh, it reminds me the spot the differences squeeze somehow. So um, there is there is also a workaround that we uh, we have been using. Um, saving history records into into some logs and then reading these logs uh, but it, then it's not not like a pro um, because it simply doesn't work often um, greg young uh, has some brilliant comparison to that uh, of that solution to a tale of uh, Hansel and Gretel, which is in Polish uh, by Kaoyashu i Małgosi. So uh, Hansel and Gretel gone deep into the woods and uh, Hansel took a slice of bread to, uh, to left a trail of breadcrumbs uh, to follow home. And uh, that had to be their history lock. But unfortunately, when the children wanted to retrieve information from their history lock, it turned out that it was eaten by the birds. So that is how you end when you um, implement workarounds. <coughs> Instead of implementing workarounds, uh, you, should, uh, you should use a proper solution, which is uh, use an event sourcing. Uh, to fully understand and feel the event sourcing, you, you have to switch your mindset, and uh, you have to focus on on the actions that happen in your application. And these actions are called the domain events. The domain event is a, is a fact, is uh, something that uh, happened in the application in the past. It's some state transition. So events, events is your data. So uh, it keeps all information about uh, what has happened and it's the main and only source of information in your in your app and it should uh, you should definitely think and uh, design about the data the data if it keeps and uh, it consists of there is a convention for events naming that saying that says if events are facts from the past so you should use uh, verbs to name them and you should uh, use a past tense. For example, um, article was published, product was added to basket, n new user has registered. 
Now let's imagine uh, you have to design a very simple block to make you better understand this presentation. And this block will have two use cases, uh, adding posts by an author and, and commenting, adding comments by, by readers. Um, I will present some source code which will be available, uh, which is available on my GitHub. Uh, and this will maybe mm, make you easier understand this, uh, this topic. To provide functionality of adding posts, we need, uh, we need an event which could be called post was published. And that event would have properties like title, content, and publishing date. And that is the basic domain event, how it should look like. And then events, as they are data, they should be stored somewhere. So they are stored in the, in the um, layer called event storage, which is a persistent layer. And it should, it should be some database. Uh, it's good if it's efficient in saving a lot of information uh, in, in, in short time. Um, it's append only. In, it can only save new information and never ever deletes or updates, saved once. When we have to, when, uh, we have to store the event, you need to create some object called, which could be called stored event, which contains a type of event, so the class it is an instance of, and an identifier of the aggregate. Um, I, would, I will explain it in a moment. Um, domain event metadata, so the, the event itself, and uh, that, that post post published, for example, you've seen before. And you could also store some optional other information, for example, event generation date. And aggregates is uh, another vital term for the aggregate, and uh, these are objects that are affected by, by, the, by the events, simply. Uh, you can compare it to the um, a document in or entity from the database. So in our in our case, uh, we have two events affecting posts aggregate. That is how we um, how our our application look like now. So that is an interface which is showing the information sh that should be provided by by every aggregate and. Uh, so it should provide its events, its aggregate ID, so the identifier. And uh, it should also provide a method for reconstituting its state. Here is an example implementation of that interface for post. As you can see, the, there is a constructor which uh, is used only for creating new instances of the object. And when you want to create a new post itself, it's, uh, there is a factory method create, factory static, met static method. Uh, and this, this method is uh, used when you create a new object, in a new post in, in your application. Um, other, other methods uh, will be explained in a moment, maybe. Uh, but first, uh, it's a very important thing to, to identify what's an aggregate for for a particular event. So a question, uh, imagine that you have event product was added to basket and what's the aggregate for it? Is it a, a product or is it a basket? Hmm? Sorry? Let's vote, yeah? So who says it's a product? <laughs> now, the aggregate for, for this, uh, for this event is uh, definitely a basket because uh, that's an object that is changed by, th by that event and the state of product is not changed by that event, only state of basket. Um, every aggregate has its identifier and uh, what's more, every event has an identifier of, uh, of the aggregate it is affecting. Um, so when you look at the, our example of post was published, we see that this event has a, an ID of 
particular concrete post ID it is affecting. And the same if we imagine that there is a, another event with the possibility to update given post, you pass also the same the same uh, post ID as a as an identifier that can distinguish which post you are really updating. Um, reconstituting aggregates. To reconstitute aggregate state, you need an aggregate history, which is retrieved from the event storage. And this aggregate history is, uh, uh, is also called an event stream. This is an ordered set of events affecting one aggregate instance, simply. So um, with event stream, you can replay full history of an aggregate, which means you create a new instance of an aggregate and then replay all events from the event stream on that aggregate. If we look at the example, here is the source code responsible for uh, reconstituting post state. And uh, you pass a post aggregate history object to reconstituting method. Then new instance is created. And then uh, for all events, the, a, a method called with, a, with some with some pattern apply and event name, uh, that method is executed. And the, at the end, we have a, a current, uh, a post with current state returned. So these applying methods, that is what could they look like. Uh, <coughs> It's simply getting an event and making some operations on on the aggregate to uh, to set currents to set proper state of it. With the reconstituted aggregate, you can uh, you are using it for all operations, and uh, you are never saving its state anywhere. You are just letting get garbage collector to remove it. Now let's focus on the use case of updating of a post. Um, you retrieve an aggregate history and replay uh, the current state of that post. Then you execute an update method on post object, but this method inside it, uh, this doesn't change uh, a state of object itself, but it does record a new event, post was updated, in that case, and then uh, replace uh, replace that event on um, on post object by calling a apply post was updated. As you see uh, on the top, the, this class is using a trait event sourced, and uh, this trait is uh, is providing such method as get events, uh, of course, and what is more important, record that and record that is simply a collection of recorded events and uh, then apply methods, basic uh, base apply method for um, replaying particular events. And uh, if we go back to our use case, after executing up the update method, post is in uh, a new state and it contains uh, all events that were uh, recorded. In this case, it's one event. Mm, then you start a transaction and uh, you dispatch and persist that events in the event storage. Uh, as you see, there is no place where you store, where you save the, ob this, the state of posts. Um, you are only saving the, the events that occurred. So dispatching events, what is that? This is um, when event was produced, it should be saved and then it should be dispatched for all listeners and uh, all interested listeners should uh, should process that event to um, to update um, a read model, which I will mention in a minute. Um, that is how plain, stupid event dispatcher could look like. It has a method for registering a new listener, which adds adds it to local collection and then has a dispatch method that for all new events is um, is running through all registered listeners and executes executes when method on them. 
Uh, that is an interface for domain event listener and uh, every listener should provide a method when. Uh, mm, and um, it's a base abstract class containing uh, the code that was common for all listeners. Mm, as you see in the constructor, every listener should register itself in the event bus. And uh, there is also a projection storage passed as a dependency. And that is actually a read model. Uh, read model in event sourcing is responsible for projecting, for projections. Uh, that is another keyword connected with event sourcing. Projecting is a, is a process of converting an event stream into some structural model. Uh, so, in, sim in simple words, uh, it's, um, it's the data stored in a way that is easy to read and designed to be easy accessible. They have a very plain structure and uh, they are updated with every event affecting any of its data. <coughs> so, we can now implement so, some uh, um, Projection. This is a projection for post lists. So we decide we need a list of posts which, which consists of a title and date of publication. So um, you pass simply, um, you pass post ID, which is uh, identifying post on the list, and uh, you pass the title and, and publication date simply. So projections are persisted. Uh, it could be persisted in database, in file system, in in cache. In some in some cases, uh, in this demo application, I've used MongoDB. Um, projections can be deleted and can be replayed to the same state with uh, with the event streams. Projections are very fast to load. Uh, especially when you want to render a large data sets. Um, you can make it asynchronic, uh, but there is a risk of uh, minimal latency of an update. You can, for example, um, make it as a queue or, or something. But uh, this, uh, this doesn't matter because uh, they are eventually consistent at the final stage with the, uh, with the data in event storage. So let's get back to the to this dispatching of event. Uh, method 1 is checking if the specific listener is applying uh, um, a concrete domain event. Mm. And if it is, it, it executes a method and, and uh, passing an event to it. Mm. Then specific listener could look could do, could look that like, and this is uh, the listener for uh, post list, and is listening on two of the events that can affect that list. Um, so that's simply uh, how read model works. And uh, when describing the event sourcing, you cannot miss the securus convention. Uh, it's an abbreviation for command query responsibility segregation. And this convention says, um, in simple words, that you should design a separate model for commands, which are operations changing the state of the application, and queries, which are, are used only for reading the, the data. And Greg Young said once that you can use CQRS without event sourcing, but when you when you implement event sourcing, you must use CQRS. And that picture is maybe the most important thing to, uh, to remember from current presentation. It's, it shows simply how event sourcing works and uh, uh, why is it so connected with CQRS. We have uh, a commands that are operating on the event model, and when new events are generated, we are saving it to event storage and both dispatching to event bus and there are listeners that are connected to this event bus which are simply updating the projection storage and this projection storage is used by a read model when you 
make a, a query type of uh, of command of uh, request a query request simply um performance when when talking with people about event sourcing uh, people always ask about the performance because people don't believe that uh, there is uh, there is no impact on uh, performance when you have to uh, run through all events when reconstituting objects so let's see some uh, points about performance about read model first read model is uh, a data which is very easy to load and uh, are extremely fast to read and um, there is of course uh, this minimal latency of an, up of an updating which I've mentioned but uh, um, if it doesn't make it asynchronously, then uh, you do not have this minimal latency, but then you can, uh, um, there is a risk that you and you have uh, plenty of listeners that uh, listen to the events, you, this might take some time to update all, all read model. And the event storage, that should be ready to save a lot of uh, small part of data. In our projects in ships that we use Cassandra for that, and uh, in this demo, as I've said, I've used MongoDB simply. So it's the data which is append only and it's immutable, which what makes it uh, very easy to uh, to scale up. And uh, in fact, it can handle uh, millions of of events. And uh, but if that's not enough, you can always make a, a snapshot. <coughs> and the snapshot is a is simple mechanism that shows that uh, that allows to reconstitute the state of the of of, uh, of the objects from some middle state, and uh, they are used to minimize the number of events that are needed to to replay when reconstituting, and that means they are actually breaking the base principle of of event sourcing because uh, they are an exceptional situation when you can save object state. How does it work? So normally uh, you reconstitute objects from, from zero state. You have a set of events and you are replaying them. But when making a snapshot, you could pick up, pick up uh, for example, this n plus, plus three event and same information that it's a snapshot along with uh, the state of, uh, of an object uh, that was in this, uh, on after this event. And then whenever you need to, um, to get the latest state of that object, it will be reconstituted, and start reconstituted starting only from, uh, uh, from this n plus three event. And of course you can make several snapshots and uh, you can even make snapshots uh, with some with some time periods, so continuously maybe, and uh, and when you need an older state than last snapshot, you can uh, iterate for the previous. You can iterate back as as uh, as far as you as you wish, even for the for the zero state. So using a snapshot doesn't mean uh, you cannot retrieve information about history before that snapshot. So that was simply the basics of event sourcing. Um, but why? You may wonder why you should use it. Is it a, is it a better model? It's, it's simply um, another way of making applications. It brings uh, some new possibilities and uh, it also brings some limitations and has some side effects. Um, but is it really better? It depends. For what? Um, this is a geocentric model of, uh, of the solar system and uh, that is how people understood uh, the space uh, centuries ago and today we know this was invalid but uh, but uh, previously it worked for years and uh, it shows that if you if you don't know you can 
make something better or other way, you can understand something uh, from another way that you are thinking you are doing it right. Um, but if you know there is an event sourcing, then you could use it, especially in the situations uh, when you when you need some uh, historic data or oh, never mind. <laughs> so it uh, simply it simplifies modeling of applications. I think it uh, forces you to think about uh, an actions that happen in your application and it gives you a, a better overview of your uh, domain. And when you have a better overview, then you know just everything. So, <laughs> what's more, event sourcing is uh, in sometimes um, is more real life like, so, uh, because the world consists of events, and actually there are situations uh, when you uh, when you think uh, like event sourcing, <laughs> for example, in a bookkeeping, when you make a, a mistake in in your papers and uh, you never cross it out and make a, make correction, but you always make a correcting operation, which is re roll backing, let's say, the state of uh, of uh, of the books, or uh, another example where you have to read a a contract, uh, an agreement, and uh, you have uh, amendments for that contract. You always read the base contract, and then you um, read the amendment that changes it. So um, there are some situations in life that work as a as a as an event sourcing. Um, that is what Greg Young said, yeah, said some time ago about um, changing states. Um, event sourcing is used in many major areas of, of life, such as um, banking applications, finance applications, insurance, bookkeeping. And there is actually not possible that you have a bank application where your account is, where your balance is uh, is kept as a as a database column and value in it. So um, account balance is also a a result of all operations that happen on your on your account, and uh, it's never stored as a single value. Mm. With event sourcing, you can go back to any point of time and you can revert the state of your application to any moment of its history and you can anal analyze and compare data from any periods. Um, you can delete and replay any read model data. And you can avoid um, deleting something accidentally. So. There are situations when you are deleting something from the database and then it turns out it was needed for something. And with event sourcing, you are never updating the state of the once saved events. And um, there also can be problems with missing data that you could have saved, but you, are, you don't have it now. And for example, let's imagine a situation when you have a an internet shop and uh, the manager of this shop comes to you and say um, let's check how many blue jackets we sold this season because uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, they are not fashioned anymore let's say and let's compare it maybe to the previous years and you say oh we cannot say we cannot actually check that because we didn't store the the color property of the jackets in our system and when you have a event source sort, sort, system, you always have a full history, you can make some new projection and replay it, and you have the data. There are, all, um, there are also some hard investigations of what was happening if you do not use event sourcing. I remember, for example, in my previous company that we, we have been developing the um, 
learning systems for um, that was used in uh, European schools and there were many situations when uh, we got a call from a client that is requesting for an explanation why a particular student has the result of uh, of uh, his saying is invalid and we were investigating what's, what was the history of his tests that uh, his result is so, so bad or so good and uh, we are basing only on some logs and uh, we are basing on some data flow in our applications and we are making some assumptions that we hope we are we were hoping that are true but we never knew that and uh, that was nightmare actually the um, basing on on history logs is uh, is a nightmare if you remember the story of Hansel and Gretel from the beginning of that presentation they could confirm that there's a there's no way to investigate back but by uh, logs and I would bet that if they used event sourcing they would finish in a much different way and that's simple example from Greg Young uh, imagine the use case from the internet shop and uh, the user that starts session adds two products into the basket and removing is removing one of them and checking out and another situation somebody starts the session adds a product and this, then he's checking out the final state of that operations is actually the same you have a bucket, basket with one product and uh, this basket was checked out but when you have a full history that what has happened you can um, implement solution like uh, suggesting items you can you would like to buy because internet shops often are assuming that if you have something in your basket and you remove it before checking out then it means it doesn't mean you didn't want it that but uh, it means you are saying ah, not this time I have a total amount of total sum too large I have to resign from something but this is something that I could buy later maybe <coughs> few words about software because even sourcing is very popular and there are some available software for uh, supporting that mm. we've been investigating something called get even store com which is a, a very high performance event storage uh, with some additional features in it and it was introduced in 2012 and still developed it was uh, introduced by Greg Ant. Uh, but it doesn't uh, we doesn't succeed with it there are also some um, PHP solutions that are used commonly by people using event sourcing like Broadway or uh, proof so you do not have to implement you implement the event source application as as in this demo by yourself you can use some uh, engines that are designed for it okay so it's time for a short summary for those who fall asleep um, what's the basic principles you can you should remember from that presentation when you are using event sourcing do not store state of objects store only the facts that happens so events reconstitute states of aggregates when when you want to to use some object dispatch events when you are uh, producing events you have to dispatch it to update projections the read model and use that projections for reading this is uh, five main points I think so any questions you can ask in Polish if you wish <laughs> I should understand no questions so thank you I also encourage you to uh, you can see that application and and check how it works in a, as a big picture maybe it will be more clear for you thanks <laughs> <laughs>